moving forward requires proper money management. Say that. That's a nice try. Let's try it one more time. Moving forward requires proper money management. You cannot move forward and you're not managing your money properly. So I thought I was going to be done when I talked about obedience uh, by giving tithes uh, a couple, three weeks ago. But I got one more thing to talk to you about, about this. Uh, moving forward requires proper money manage management through challenging times, through challenging seasons. How many of you can identify that we are in the midst of a challenging season? economically and otherwise. Second Corinthians chapter eight is the passage that we're gonna deal with today. And uh, this past weekend, turn to Second Corinthians chapter eight. This past weekend marked the culmination of the $640 million dollar lotto deal. Now, I'm not going to ask if any of y'all bought tickets. Because I don't want to make y'all lie in church. But I know we got some people here who bought some tickets. If y'all all say amen together, nobody know I'm talking about you. Matter of fact, the report says that $1.5 billion dollars in sales. At a dollar crack, $1.5 billion were purchased by people. And I heard that one of those winning three tickets was somewhere in Maryland. Huh? Baltimore County? Y'all know where it is? You live in Baltimore? Oh, it was on the news. <laughs> Sister Nadine said, listen what she said, listen, if she had won, she would have given me a tithe. She said, would I have taken it? Money is green. <laughs> Come on, talk. <laughs> Some of y'all money who come in offers on Sundays ain't totally been made clean now. $1.5 billion billion people bought tickets in hopes of a little investment with a big return. Matter of fact, a little investment and they want a huge unnatural return. And here's what I want to talk about this because um, here's, what, here, here's what Proverbs, jot this verse down. You don't have to turn there. I just want you to jot it down. Proverbs 10.22. Y'all, you know, try to get to buy the ticket and hit it big, what you need to research is what happens to people who win these lotteries and how their lives go out of control. But Proverbs 10.22 says, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich. And God adds no sorrow with it. Y'all missed a great spot to say amen. When God blesses you, there's no sorrow associated with it. I don't want any blessing that got sorrow connected with it. And the track record is the people who win the lottery have sorrow galore on top of it. But the sorrow of the Lord. But I want to talk about this morning as we look at that, that piece about, a, about Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. He writes this letter to the church in Corinth. It is his second letter. He wrote the first letter to them because they were jacked up, messed up, toe up. It was a jacked up church. They had all kinds of drama going on when he wrote them in the first letter. And here in the second letter, they, they're doing better. They have progressed. They have moved, they have moved forward. <laughs> Amen. They have, they have achieved some things, and he's bragging on them. Matter of fact, he's bragging about this church to one of his sons in the ministry. When you read chapter 6, chapter 7, he's bragging on the church in Corinth. 
And when we get to verse of chapter 8, when we get to chapter 8, he now begins to brag to the Corinthian church about another church called the Macedonian church. He's bragging to the Corinthian church about the Macedonian church because the Macedonian churches had contributed to the needs of some poor saints in Jerusalem. And it is, in fact, a significant thing that here this church in Macedonia has given, and Paul is writing to the Corinthian church to tell them about it. As a matter of fact, here's what he says, verse 1. Are y'all with me? In verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the peace, the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. He, said, he says, I need to tell y'all about how God smeared his grace upon the churches in Macedonia. And that one little verse, that one little sentence is, is jam-packed with significant information because here's what he says. He says, the church in Macedonia was smeared with grace. And y'all heard me talk about grace before and I can never talk about grace enough because in order for you and I to be what God wants us to be, how many of you know you need grace? Grace is God's empowering presence. It is God's ability to give you what you need to be, what you're supposed to be, and to do what you're supposed to do. When God gives you grace, listen to this, when God gives you grace, grace gives you the desire to want to do what you're supposed to do. If you don't want to do right, you're, you are lacking grace. When you don't want to make the right decisions, grace is minus from your life. And Paul says, God took his grace and smeared it. And, and I, I've come to the conclusion how much I need grace. I need grace. I need grace to love my wife. I, love, I need grace to raise my kids. I need grace to pastor y'all, you, y'all people. I need grace. I need God to help me want to be your pastor. I need grace to want to love my wife. I need, because sometimes my wife and I... Uh, have intense fellowship. Anybody here married and had some intense fellowship? And I need grace to make me want to love her in spite of my anger. I need grace to raise my kids. To raise these kids and not take them out. I need grace. And, and Paul says, God smeared his grace on the Macedonian church. And, 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 and I like that. He says, God, God says, he smeared his grace upon them. And that is a significant thing that God gave them grace. But here's what is significant about them. These are people in Macedonia who were living through challenging times. And what you and I need to understand is you're not, this is not the first time that you face challenges in your life and it won't be the last. And the church in Macedonia faced challenging times and God smeared grace on them so they could make it through it. And I am persuaded and convinced that God will give you the grace you need to make it through your challenging times. And he says, God, moreover, brother, let me make known to you about the grace of God bestowed on the, on the churches of Macedonia. And, and here's, I got... I got two points I want to hit today. Two points, and I got some sub-points to some of these points. But first thing I want to talk about is the condition that the Macedonian church was in. Somebody say condition. condition. I need to talk about the condition of the Macedonian church. And he tells us right here in verse 2 what their condition is. He says that in a great trial of affliction, y'all see that, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. There's, listen, stop right there. Stick a pin. Here's a church in Macedonia smeared with grace and here's what they're going through. They have great trial of affliction and they got deep poverty. Now let me talk about those two things because some of you think you're the first person to go through your drama, your pain, your situation. You're the only one. You need to understand that the church in Macedonia had number one, great trial of affliction. That word trial means they were being tested. Here's what it means. They, not, not only that they were being tested, that's what trial means, but it means it was great trial. Here's what it means. It means they had trial after trial after trial. Anybody ever lived at a season of your life, you got one problem after another problem after another problem. As soon as you think one thing is over, there's something else knocking at the door. You haven't even got the first problem out the house yet, and yet there's the next one walking up the driveway about to knock on your door. Great trial, trouble after trouble. They had great trial of affliction. And the word affliction means pressure. Now, if you keep on living, I promise you, life is going to hand to you pressure moments. 
You can't get rid of it. You don't get saved to relieve pressure or get rid of pressure. That's not the reason you ought to get saved. Matter of fact, your pressure might become more intense after you get saved. But here's the difference between the pressure before Jesus and the pressure after Jesus. When you got Jesus, you got somebody to help relieve the pressure from off of you. The problems might not go away. The trials might not change. Your husband might not get no better. Your children might not behave differently. But because of what he does on the inside of you, I wish I had a praying church, he gives you something to be able to deal with the pressure of life. And the Macedonian, had, the Macedonian church had trials and they had great trials of affliction. They had great pressure. That's what the text says. It says right here, that in a great trial of affliction, and it also says they had, their, uh, they had an abundance, they had deep poverty. Somebody say deep poverty. Deep. That word poverty means they were seriously impoverished. They were in utter poverty. They were beggars. That's what the scripture says about them. Here was a church that was so poor they were poor. Y'all too slow, just too slow to get the point. They were so poor, they were so uh, deep below the bare minimum. These were people who were in, the scripture says, deep poverty. poverty. Now here's what y'all need to know. Your situation might be deep, but ain't none of y'all in deep poverty. Thank all of y'all for clapping right there. Now let me let the other jokers go ahead and give God a praise that they ain't in deep poverty. You better thank God you are not in deep poverty. I never understood what deep poverty was until I went to a third world country. When I traveled outside the United States and saw humans living in conditions that we would not let our dogs live in. That's deep poverty. I know you're complaining that your money is tight and all of that, but you have not, you are not in deep poverty. You do got some kind of roof over your head. You do have some clothes on your back. You do got some food. You haven't experienced deep poverty. But check this out. Here's a church who have great trials of affliction. They got pressure and trial after trial after trial and pressure and deep poverty. They ain't got no money and trials, but guess what is sandwiched in between there? Look at the text, an abundance of joy. Some of y'all were more happy when you didn't have nothing than you are now that you got something. Here, look at it, in between their trials of affliction and their deep poverty, they had an abundance of joy. I'm going somewhere, hang with me for just a moment. I need you to understand and recognize the fact that the reality is, is things will not make you have joy. If I can get that out your head, if I can lose your spirit from the comprehension that if you just get that new car, if you can get that new house, if you can move on up, if you can move out of the condo, out of the apartment and get you the house, if you can get that new Mercedes Benz, the new Lexus, the new Jaguar, whatever the latest ride is, if you can get those new clothes and somehow it's going to make you happy, things will never make you happy. Hold up, while I'm, while I'm there, some of y'all think if you can just find the right person to be married to, it'll make you happy. But I need to tell you, things nor people will never fulfill you and make you happy. Stop chasing after it. Stop running after it. The, the world has sold us a bill of goods and we thought that if we just got the stuff, if we got the person, if we got this, if we got that, we would be happy. And we got people who have achieved and bought and got and received, got to that place and are just as miserable as if they didn't have it Things do not bring you joy. Here's what, here's what brings you joy. According to Psalm, here's what Psalm says, 1611, I believe says, in his presence is the fullness of joy. If you don't have no joy, it's an indicator that you're not spending time in the presence of God. Go on and teach it, Pastor. 
I, I'm, let, me, let me roll that back and give it to you again. If you are missing joy, if you're depressed, sad, unhappy, troubled on every side, you are missing the ability of getting up into the presence of God. Here was a people in Macedonia had God's grace smeared on them and his grace was smeared on them and they had joy that was abundant even though they didn't have no money and they had trouble and trial after situation, but they were able to face challenging times because they knew how to get in the face of God. And so, and so their condition was great trial, deep poverty, but they had an abundance of joy. They had great trial, deep poverty, but they had an abundance of joy. And they were able with that joy to function, point two, out of commitment. And let me talk about commitment. My first point was the condition that they were in, my second point today is the commitments that they made. Now, listen to me carefully. This is a teaching word. If you can get this in your heart and spirit, it'll change your life, I believe. They were people who learned how to live by commitment. That's a curse word today, commitment. People don't want to talk about commitment. People don't want to be committed. Uh, there used to be a time when people worked the same job for 30 years and retired, but that's, that's not the way it is anymore. It used to be a time you joined the church, you stayed with that church till you died, but that's not the case anymore. It used to be a time you got married to somebody and it was till death do you part. You, <laughs> used to be a time that you wouldn't move in with a person until they had made a commitment of marriage. But people don't like that word commitment. We don't want to be obligated. We don't want to commit ourselves. And I'm here to tell you today that God wants people to recognize moving forward in challenging times requires a commitment. It requires a commitment. I'm committed. I, 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 um, one day my wife and I was having some intense fellowship. Matter of fact, several days we've had intense fellowship. And I told her some profound words. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, she got mad at me. She told me to leave. I told her, I'm not leaving. I'm committed. Amen. Now, matter of fact, matter of fact, my commitment to her is so deep that if she left me, I'm going with her wherever she's going. Are y'all the choir that sang at the first service? Y'all see, y'all act, y'all gotta act like y'all ain't heard me say this already. I see, I was about to say something profound. Yeah, what I told her is, I'm committed to you. I'm, I made a commitment. I'm committed. We don't live by commitment anymore. We live by convenience. If it's convenient for me, then I'll do it. Amen. I, but I told my wife, I'm committed to her. Amen. I'm committed. I live a life. And God has called us to commitments. The church in Macedonia was able to have God's grace smeared on them because they made levels of commitment. Amen. And you and I need to understand, we can never move forward if our commitment or our engagement with God is occasional and sometimes. That was hot right there. Y'all didn't, didn't understand. That was hot. We need to be committed. We need to operate our lives by principles of commitment. I told my wife, divorce is not an option. I have never considered divorce. Now, murder, I thought about that a couple of times. I don't need to say that to this crowd right here. Let me, let me rewind that and take that back from this crowd. 
because I'm committed to her. God's called us to be committed. And here's a, here's a church that is committed, and they were committed to four basic things as it related to how they manage their money during challenging seasons. If you can get this in your heart, if you can get these principles in your heart, it'll change your life. Here's number one. Look at verse number. Number two says, verse two, that in the great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Here's what that means. It means even though they had great affliction, great trial of affliction, even though they had deep poverty, they still abounded in the liberality of them sharing what they had. And what I call that is this, they gave abundantly. Somebody say they gave abundantly. Yeah. Say it one more time, they gave abundantly. Yeah. They, they were people who gave from what they had. They didn't have much. But from the little bit that they had, they gave abundantly. Some of you will never get ahead in life. You will never be able to do anything in life because you're, t you're stingy, you're tight. You ain't tight wad. If I went to the dictionary and looked up the word tight wad, some of y'all's pictures is right next to the definition. You're talking about you can't afford to give and you can't do this, but you are tight wad, stingy. And it's difficult to reap a harvest from the field of God's power when you have not planted any seeds. It is difficult to reap a harvest from the power of God's favor and anointing when you haven't planted any seeds. Some of y'all want to treat God like the lottery. You want to buy a dollar ticket and you want to win $640 million. Here's what the Bible teaches, a different principle. That's, that's unnatural. That's not normal. That's not a law that you can count on. Put down a dollar and get 640 million back. Though it is tempting. <laughs> and for the record, I did not buy a single ticket. I worked too hard for my money to go out and do something that I don't have a snowball's chance in hell and get. <laughs> Y'all got money like that to give away? Bring it up here, I'll hold it on to it, hold on to it for you. I was about to make a profound point. What was I saying? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Here's what the scripture teaches, you reap what you sow. You reap in proportion to what you sow. If you sow a harvest, if you sow a seed, you're gonna reap a harvest in proportion to the relationship of what you sow. That's the natural principle. And here the church in Macedonia is mentioned throughout all of eternity. Their name is called out. Paul proudly talks about them to, to the Corinthian church. And here we are talking about this, these churches thousands of years later. We're talking about them and they're, done, they're no longer around. They're not even here, but we're talking about them because they are a people who God recognized and honored because they gave liberally out of the little bit that they had. That's something that captures the attention of God. It gets a hold of his heart. They, they were a people who gave abundantly. Not only did they give abundantly, look at verse number three. Look at verse three. Here's my second sub point. Verse three says, for I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they, they were freely willing. They, listen, here's what this, the second sub point is, is that they gave beyond their ability. They gave beyond what they had the capacity to give. They gave well beyond, and here's what Paul says, they gave according to their ability, but matter of fact, he says, beyond their ability. They did more than what was expected of them to give. Now here's where I stand in life. I stand at a place in life where I want to be able to give to God. I love to give. I'm a giver. I'm a giver. I love to give. I look for opportunity to give. I look for places to sow. I look for people to bless. I love giving. And what I discovered about God is that if I give, he gives it back to me, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And guess what? I discovered that God wants me to give way past, and I want to give way past what folks say is reasonable for me to give. 
This is a church that people would say they just didn't have it. They were in deep poverty, but they latched the whole of a principle. And in the season, in the season of challenging times, they gave beyond their ability. Some of you are here today and you don't think you can afford to give. But I'm here to tell you, if you ever want to get up out of the drudgery of the hole that you're in, you got to learn to take from what you have and give beyond your ability. Plant something somewhere. Plant something somewhere. You want a harvest, you got to plant a seed. You want God to prosper you, you got to plant a seed and do beyond your ability. I got to rush on. My time is running out. Here's the third thing. Verse number three says, not only did they give beyond their ability, but verse three says, they were freely willing imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Here's what Paul says, the church in Macedonia was giving beyond their ability to serve the needs of the poor people in Jerusalem. He said, but they did it begging us to take their money. Here these poor people came to Paul and said, please take our money. Nobody ain't never come up to me and say, Pastor, I can't afford this. This is way past what I'm able to do. Here, take it. I've never been in a situation where I said, no, I can't take your money. No, oh, Pastor, here, please take it. No, I can't take it. I can't. And then nobody chased me down. Here, take my money. <laughs> <laughs> nobody tackled me, shoved it in my pocket. But that's what they did. They tracked Paul down. And even in their deep poverty, they implored him urgently. You have to stop looking at yourself Amen. as a mission and start seeing yourself having the ability by sowing to get up out of the hole that you're in and stop expecting people to do something for you all the time. <laughs> do y'all understand what I'm saying to you today? They were a people that gave with a willing attitude. Matter of fact, here's what 2 Corinthians 9, just one chapter later, says this. I don't have time to turn there. It says, God loves a cheerful giver. God loves somebody who gives joyfully, laughing, cheerful. Matter of fact, I don't think I'll ever see this in my day. But the word cheerful means that when they gave, they were rolling on the floor laughing. <laughs> you think there might be a day that, that one day, it's just laughter just breaking out all through the church because they, they gave and they just leaping for joy, dancing, laughing. <laughs> Woo! Y'all can't see it either in your mind, can you? I can't see it. But that's what these people were. They were willing givers they did it with great joy and what God is looking for is people who understand that when you give to him he gonna give it back to you pressed down shaking together running over here's here's what they understood they were in deep poverty then but they knew they weren't gonna always be in deep poverty they were having great affliction then, but they weren't going to always have great affliction. What you're going through is only for a season. And what determines what happens when this season is over is determined by what you do while you're in the season. And I'm just trying to tell you that you can't be tight, you can't be stingy, you can't be selfish. You got to have a mentality to say, it's tight now, it might be tough, but I'm going to give beyond my ability. I'm going to give willingly, I'm going to give abundantly, and watch God open up the windows of heaven and pour you out blessings that you will not have room enough to receive. Now let me close this dynamic message with a final subpoint. Here's their commitments. They were committed to being abundant givers. They were a, a committed to giving beyond their ability. They were committed to have a willing attitude. But here's what verse 5 says. Verse 5 says, and not only has we had hoped they gave, he said, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Paul, Paul says the reason they could give out of their poverty and the reason they could give so much and the reason they can do it uh, beyond their ability and the reason they can do it with a willing attitude is because they had already given themselves to God. 
Y'all know what I'm discovering? We got a lot of people who are in church. They've joined the church. They've been baptized. They've joined the ministry, but they haven't given their hearts to Jesus. They haven't given themselves to the Lord. Now y'all can say whatever you want. I don't believe that a person can have an encounter with God where God gets in your head and you start thinking differently gets in your eyes you look at life differently gets in your mouth your language changes gets in your ears you hear things and start listening to new things gets in your heart you start loving folk that you used to hate gets in your hands you stop touching the things you weren't supposed to touch gets in your legs and feet you start walking differently I don't believe all of that can happen and he slides around your wallet. Come on, talk back at me. Say out your amen. Say you hit me or amen. Say you're on it or amen. Just say anything, but just get back to me. Talk back. You, you don't believe that you can have an encounter with God and keep your money? and not be willing to give it to him. I don't know anybody that's had an encounter with God who's not willing to sow joyfully and willfully. When it's all said and done, brothers and sisters, when it's all said and done, where your heart is reflected by where your money is. Can I say that again? Yes. Your heart is an indication, is indicated, what the condition of your heart is indicated, the indication of it is by where you spend your money. Amen. And what am I talking about? I'm not taking up no offering today. Y'all just relax. <laughs> I'm not after offering. I'm after instilling principles of commitment in your life Amen. that when it comes to dealing with resources, you'll be rather more liberal with God than you are stingy.